thanks for coming tonight, everybody. My name's Fritz Klassner. I'm the Natural Resource Program Manager with the Office of Monarch Land Management. Tonight, uh, has, uh, Michelle Montgomery with the uh, Hawaii Ant Lab is going to talk about ants. Uh, she is, Michelle is a research specialist with the Hawaii Ant Lab. She got her degree, or bachelor's degree here at UH Hilo. She's currently working on her PhD at Canberra University in Australia, but she's based here in Hawaii. Um, the Hawaii Ant Lab is actually based here in Hilo, but they have a statewide role in providing research and outreach about <laughs> ants and ant issues, ant control, understanding ants uh, across the state, particularly little fire ants. But in our case, we first uh, connected with the Hawaii Ant Lab because Mauna Kea is probably the single largest ant-free geographic area in the state. Uh, there are no ants above about nine or 10,000 feet, about, about 10,000 feet on Mauna Kea, as best we can tell from a, quite a number of surveys over the past half a dozen to dozen years. Um, and that's something that uh, between the, this, this, you know, the astronomy community, the Office of Mauna Kea Management, and the Ant Lab, we have an invasive species plan, and we're trying very hard to keep it that way. Um, we're particularly concerned about something called Argentine ant. It's not a human test, it is more, much more of an ecological test, uh, but I think probably most of you have an interest in uh, little fire ants, that's why. But uh, I, I don't, want, don't want to go into the subject of ants beyond what Michelle's going to talk about beyond that. Steal their thunder. So with that, uh, thank you, Michelle. Hi, guys. How are you? Are you guys sugared up enough? <laughs> the lights are down. We don't want napping here. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about ants, right, obviously, but I'm not really going to focus on the little fire ants so much. Um, I'm not sure if you guys were aware. Uh, we're going to go through um, some general ant issues here in Hawaii, some of the um, problem ants other than little fire ants, and kind of putting it all into a context of the same concepts for management apply for all of these species. Um, and you just have to tweak it here and there to suit the needs of uh, your particular pest expert. So that's kind of the overall of what we're going to be talking about. Um, I'll go over a little bit uh, ant 101, like the biology of ants, what they're normally like, what makes our little pests different, um, and how we use that kind of information to put it together to uh, develop uh, practical management strategies for us. So, many people don't really realize how important ants are, but they're extremely important um, and do a whole lot of ecological services. So, they're seed dispersers, they're nutrient cyclers, they're decomposers. They have a whole lot of roles. Some are even pollinators of some plants. Um, they're very, very important in our ecosystems. Um, but unfortunately, they really receive very little attention considering all of the other things that get a lot of attention, like honeybees. People always talk about the honeybees. When we're talking about insects, nobody really cares about the ants. Um, a lot of times people like foresters will consider ants being an agriculture pest and not a forest pest. Uh, and this doesn't hold water. So we're trying to educate all different sectors about the importance of ants in general and how species can really impact the ecosystems, whether it's urban, whether it's agriculture, or whether they're forest environments. These guys have been around a long time, far, far longer than humans. They're going to be around and controlling the world long after humans are extinct. We're not going to get rid of them, so why, so why try? Right? We're not going to get rid of all of them. But we can protect ourselves and we can protect our own little uh, piece of our pie and uh, make it so that we can live together better. Basically, their success comes from what we call eusociality. This isn't, uh, it's, it's basically their nesting habits and their other behaviors, which allow them to make decisions as individuals, but always it's in relation to the betterment of the colony. So the important part is the colony, not the individual. 
These guys are, they're social insects like honeybees or other bees, wasps. So they have a similar um, colony structure. You have, uh, you always start out, you have your queen. That's the big manna. She makes all the eggs, all the babies. She makes everything. She makes it work. And then you have your males, which don't actually usually look like ants. They look more like little wasps. And your workers. And the workers do everything. They do everything from foraging for food and resources to excavating mounds and making their beautiful little homes um, to caring for the brood and caring for the queens and caring for everything. So they do all of the work. Then you have the brood. And the brood is basically the eggs, the larva, and the, uh, the pupa that are turning into the adults. It's all of these combined to make up the colony, which we consider to be a super organism. So if you think about it in terms of the colony is the body and the ants, the individual ants are like cells that create and make that body work. It's kind of like us. So when we think about management and we think about how things function in the ant world, we need to really think about the colony and not the individuals. And once we start thinking in that sense, we're able to go and make better decisions for our management that can actually get us ahead to the next step to our end goal. And so shifting our thinking a little bit when it comes to pest management and not just run and grab the raid and spray the little buggers that you see, because that ain't gonna work. So, there is an individual life cycle of an individual ant, you know, the egg all the way through to an adult. The colony also has um, a general annual life cycle. Uh, the cycle goes, you know, that you have reproduction, mostly reproduction of uh, reproductives, so queens and males. Then they go into mating, these big mating flights, they disperse um, after they have a good time the Queensland and found their own colonies and then it builds um, throughout the year. So basically this happens on an annual basis. Um, you get these ebbs and flows of population densities uh, in, when uh, the colony is functioning as normal. The, when it comes to food, I mean, you see the ants coming to your food, taking little bits away. You see leaf cutter ants carrying big leaves around, um, dragging other insects or worms, whatnot, into the depths of their mounds. But really, adult ants are liquid feeders. They don't actually have the mouth parts or the, the organs to be able to process solid food. So they take solid food and they suck all the goodness out of it and carry that around and they share that liquid between individuals and it goes all the way through to everyone in the colony. Everybody's sharing their resources. The only ones in the colony that actually eat solid foods are the older um, larvae, the ones that are just about to make it to adulthood. Um, when, they act, when they share their, their liquid, we call that trophallaxis. And so if you hear um, people talk, if you hear it come in, if you come in and talk to me in the office, I probably will use that word a lot because I'm not very good at using other terminology. Um, so, oops, going back. So that's what, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about literally this right there. Um, there's three essential nutrients that they're really going for, and they'll collect different amounts of those resources depending on the needs of the colony. So if there's more brood um, production, the queens are especially uh, fertile, they're laying all kinds of eggs. Um, they might collect more, uh, more proteins than normal, but if there's a whole lot of workers and they need a whole lot more energy, they might be collecting more of the carbohydrates. So depending on available resources and what the colony needs, um, their stage and development, they might be collecting different things. Now, everyone has a job in the colony. Um, these, the ants that you see are the foraging workers. Those are the ones that are going out looking for food, right? 
So they're going to go out, they're going to choose, they're going to come bump into something, taste and say, oh, that's, that's some delicious stuff. And they're going to go recruit their, their friends to come and get more of it, bring it back. And then it goes down this network um, from, from them to other ants to more ants. And eventually it makes its way to the queen. As they share, whatever they foraged on gets diluted. So this is like one dilution, a second dilution, a third dilution, and so on. It can do, dilute dozens of times before it makes it to the queen. So if we're talking about baits and insecticides, when we're talking about management, we have to consider when we develop these products, we have to consider this dilution factor into our calculations. So it has to be able to be effective to kill the queens and these other these other ants, even after it gets diluted to, to the extreme. But it can't be so strong um, initially that it kills these workers and makes them sick. Because if those get sick or die, then they're obviously not going to be sharing that food. And it's never going to get to the source. And we want to get here. We want that stuff to get there. Make sense? Excellent. Um, another thing that is really important when you notice, you guys are, we're seeing all of these, and if we're thinking about little fire ants, for an example, I mean, you see thousands, hundreds of thousands of these ants foraging around, right? That is really only about 10% of the actual colony. The rest are staying in, in the nest and doing their other little nesty bits. Um, taking care of the brood, taking care of the queens, um, doing the general housekeeping. Uh, and this is true of pretty much all species. Um, they're all contained, they're mostly contained in there. So what do you think happens when you grab the rake and you spray down what you see? Not a whole lot. <laughs> because you have 90% still around. Naturally, you're going to have these competition for resources, right? Um, you have different types of aggression, different types of competition. You have competition between different species. This is what we call inter-specific aggression. Um, and then you have aggression and competition between the same species of two neighboring nests. So like these guys, they don't like their neighbors. <laughs> They're not good neighbors. They take care of their house, the other ones take care of their house. If you come into their neighbor's house, you're dead. You're going to be ripped to shreds. Um, this kind of aggression is really linked to these pheromone cues uh, in ants that have single queens. And a single queen colony is normal. That's, most ants have these single queen colonies. Um, but aside from those kind of biological factors, there's also in like their native range where they're supposed to be, they have all of these other factors like predators, parasitoids, um, diseases, stuff like that, that keep their population in check. So there's all, all these different things that are going on to keep the population in check. So most of the time they don't get out of control. But when we talk about Hawaii, we're in a whole different ball game here. Okay, Hawaii is in the middle of the Pacific, obviously, um, where there's nothing around for you know thousands of miles. Um, the the isolation here has really created a hot spot for biodiversity. Um, our flora and fauna have developed over you know, hundreds of thousands of years or to, uh, to not have defense mechanisms because we don't have these herbivores, we don't have these uh, parasites, we don't have these predators and so they didn't ever need it. Because of that, our systems are very susceptible to introduction. So anything that we bring in is gonna have an impact here. It's gonna behave differently here than it does in its native range. We did not, as far as we know, Hawaii has never had native ants. Um, 
And this is very unusual. There are very, very few places in the world that have evolved with no ants. Okay, despite this, we have about 60 species um, present, as we know. Um, but only a few of them are actually an issue. Maybe uh, just pretty much just these actually um, people are concerned about or have actually had caused significant damage. Um, if you notice the ones with the asterisks, with the little stars, those are on um, the list of the world's 100 worst invasive species. Um, there are five species ants on that list, and we have four of them. Yeah, yeah, kind of a bad, a bad deal for us. We're trying really hard to um, monitor and make sure the last one, which is the red imported fire ant, we're trying really hard to make sure that it doesn't get here. If it does, that it doesn't get established. And so we have people throughout the state um, not just us with our lab, but with the Department of Agriculture and with the USDA, um, not only the state, and with the invasive species committees that go around and check places and follow up. And we're very vigilant to, um, to share that information and make sure that things don't get established. So now you might want to ask yourself, why have, why are those species special? Did I hear because they're stupid assholes? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are right. <laughs> well, they are naughty little rule breakers. Okay. Um, and it's true that most of the ants that we have here still stick by the guidelines that I pointed out, you know, single queens, um, there's other things keeping them in check. They're aggressive with each other. They're aggressive with um, other species. And so there's natural things that are keeping them in check. The ones that, that were on that list, they break the rules. They don't have that annual cycle of kind of growth and decline. Um, they pretty much produce their reproductives year round, just whenever they get the whimsy. Um, they don't only disperse in one way, they'll disperse through, some will disperse through mating swarms, but others will disperse by what we call budding. That's when a queen will take, she packs up a bunch of workers on her back and she just moves to the next available spot right next door. And then she sets up camp. Um, and then the big one is hitchhiking. Some people ask us, so how fast can, for example, little fire ants, how fast can they move? How fast can they spread? About 50 miles an hour on the back of your car. <laughs> and I'm serious, we are, this is human mediated dispersal. We move them around inadvertently. I mean, some people know they're moving them around. Hopefully most of us here in the room don't realize they're moving them We also really subscribe to the whole sharing is caring thing. For humans, it's a great idea. For ants, it's a great idea, um, but not for humans. Um, so because of this, they're able to have, they have many queens in a single colony. They don't just go by the one queen rule. Um, they, because of this, they end up having very low interspecific aggression. They share and they move, um, they like their neighbors, they move between the nests and that will allow for extremely high densities of ants in a smaller area. And because they move between all of those nests within an area, whether it's in the trees or on the ground, they'll, they'll move throughout them all. And then we have to expand that label. Remember when I said the ants are like the cells, are like the cells in the colony organism. Well, now we have to think of each individual nest as like a cell in the greater super colony, which is the area that all of those nests are interconnected. And so when we're trying to manage these kind of ants, that becomes an even bigger problem because you have a whole lot more to deal with. And because they build these super colonies and have these extremely high densities in an area, nothing else really survives. They completely wipe out almost 
all other insects in the area, right? Especially ants. For uh, little fire ants, you'll see a line, basically a line in the sand. One side is only little fire ants. The other side, you might see three or four different species. It's a very clear line. When we know how ant biology and behavior works, and we know why our pests or the issues with our pests and how they differ, um, we can take all of this information and slap it together and come up with effective prevention and treatment stack strategies. Because if we have to understand, we have to know our enemy and able to exploit their weaknesses and exploit their strengths <laughs> against them. And that's pretty much what we do at the ant lab. We go around exploiting ants all the time. <laughs> um, because we move these ants around, um, that's one of the main reasons how they spread. Uh, we call these guys tramp ants. So they just hitch a ride and they go wherever, wherever our whimsy takes them. Um, they're gonna hitch a ride on vehicles. Um, potted plants and mulch is kind of the classic uh, example but they will hitch a ride on vehicles um, and on building material and on machinery. Think about, um, think about your yard, the, your landscaper. You think they go and they wash off their lawnmower every time they go to, uh, they go to somebody's yard? No. Um, and then they come to your yard and they do your yard. You think that they could be spreading ants? Absolutely, they could be spreading a lot of other things, plant disease, all kinds of stuff. So it's the same concepts of spreading diseases, plant diseases, and ants and invasive species. The same uh, concepts hold. Um, even though um, they share some behaviors a lot, sometimes the, the biology and the behaviors may differ slightly and vary from one tramp species to another. Um, even so, we can still use the same general concepts when we're talking about prevention uh, to, to really combat any one of the species. It just takes some minor tweaks here and there um, to fit it to the niche that you need. First and foremost, prevention. If you have ants and you're working to get rid of them and you get to that end goal, you're gonna have to go back to prevention. If you don't have the ants, you wanna be at prevention because it's far easier to prevent than it is to treat. In order to prevent, you're gonna to need to know common pathways, um, know how these things are spreading, know what's high risk, know what's lower risk, um, different areas that you should be getting things or areas that you should avoid. Um, you should have a good quarantine measure, and the quarantine can be as big or as small as your needs are. And then really the biggest effort is in monitoring, doing your surveys um, to, to detect an infestation or an introduction early on, so you don't get into the situation where it's out of control. And because most people, once they discover that they have a problem, it's out of control and it, it feels like a hopeless or a lost cause. Okay, you feel like, how am I ever gonna get ahead on this? Um, it's not difficult, but getting past that feeling of despair is difficult. Um, really think about when you're bringing things onto your property um, or your things, not just bringing them on, but um, you're having work done. Ask yourself some simple questions. What's the risk of whatever this is having ants? Whether it's little fire ants or whether it's something else. Ask yourself, where did this come from? Did, it, did this come from an area that is widespread? These ants are widespread. Or is it from an area that uh, it's not, not so much, it's pretty spotty in that area? Um, or is it from an area that we haven't detected any of those ants? And then also ask yourself, how easy is it gonna be to treat whatever this is? 
um, it's going to be a lot harder to treat uh, a giant cluster of bamboo than it is cut flower, right? So you're going to have, if you ask yourself these three questions, you can actually assess the risk and make an educated choice on, oh, well, is the, does the risk outweigh the benefit? Am I willing to take this risk? Some of you are going to be willing to take a risk no matter what. I mean, if you already have an infestation on your property and you're going to, you're going to treat it, might as well do your risky stuff now, right? Do your risky stuff while you already have the problem and then start your treatment and then you're going to be treating it in entirety. If you don't have the problem, then you're going to be a lot more cautious about what you want to be bringing on um, and the risks may not outweigh the benefit. You may say it's not, it's not worth it. Just for an example, this is little fire ants. And I'm going to use LFA as kind of a general, as a, a general example because I do this all the time. <coughs> so each one of those red spots is, uh, are like detections and kind of the size is rel relative to the number of detections. Obviously, I think we all know this. It's not a surprise. The east side is covered. There are less <coughs> LFA free spots than there are LFA infected spots. Um, there are still a lot of people that are actively treating and you can effectively treat and uh, mitigate the impact on you. You can't force your neighbor to do the same though. But they've been uh, detected in every district on the island. And just because there's no little dot here or there's no dot in here doesn't mean that the ants are not there. It means that we haven't gotten the sample from there. Okay. Um, but the point from this is there are few detections in this area. There are even fewer detections up in here. Um, so if you're thinking about going on Craigslist, most of these pictures are from Craigslist of services, things that people are offering. Let's say you want to buy a car. And let's say you're like in white man. Do you really want to buy that car from Pune? <laughs> <laughs> really? No, uh, you know, I mean, this is a very real example. I made this mistake. I was living, um, I've been living from Volcano to Mountain View for the entire time I've been on the island. And I never had a problem with a little fire ants. I monitor, I did all my stuff. I bought a truck from someone in Kapoho. I wasn't thinking about it, and I brought it up to our property. And about a week later, you know, I had a plate with that I had a case of bee on or something, and the ants were all over the plate. And I freaked out. I'm like, of course, I'm going to be the one to bring ants to this property. <laughs> of course, this is how the world works. Um, but it really it opened my eyes that I wasn't thinking of beyond the very typical, the cliche potted plants mulch and the cliche high risk things. Um, another thing that really just got brought up, porta potties. They get moved from one place to another all the time. Um, we're working with Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Um, we've worked with them in the past to help them with uh, their monitoring and kind of consulting with them for uh, risk mitigation while they uh, repair the roads, um, rebuild roads, and are having so much construction going on. And the woman that we're working with emailed me today and was asking us about the porta potties because they're doing their surveys and they didn't think about it. They did, the, did their surveys around these porta potties that got dropped off and they're finding little fire ants all within them. And they had several dropped off at different places in the park. And so now they're going, they're if they, they can try to work with the companies to see if the companies can clean up their product and only bring clean product, that's not gonna guarantee anything. You don't know who's doing what, how they're going to be cleaning up that product, right? So there's no guarantees there. So they have to go through and they have to then take their own measures of treating, um, treating each one of those 
and basically treating the site that they put them in as a mini quarantine. So using a barrier treatment around there, baiting it and trying to keep it contained to those isolated spots. And then they're gonna have to go back to those spots regularly for many years to survey and resurvey and make sure that the ants did not establish. So if we go back and we think about these questions, these questions are really important when you're thinking about and you're gonna be doing things on your property. Um, it's, this can really, really make or break your, your whole ant strategy. I also wanna point out right here, this is a bee box. A bee box, so a hive. Um, the ants will nest inside the hive. They haven't been, um, they haven't been shown to really harm the hives. The hives still thrive, but beekeepers move these throughout the island for demonstration, for pollination. Um, they, they hire out their bees. This has been something that I worked with the apiary um, project for, for quite a while. And this was something that they didn't even, they didn't really consider. And a lot of beekeepers don't consider, they don't understand, or they don't, it's just not at the forefront of their mind. Not that they're doing it intentionally. It's just not something they generally think about. So really, really uh, try to absorb all of that. <laughs> huh? If you've got a like strong hive like that, like how do you, and, and ants get in, how do you kill them without killing your bees? Um, very difficult. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, you could try um, some baits, like granule baits, because the bees aren't interested in those. Um, and it might, it, I don't think it would get back and do any harm to the hives, because the bees aren't going to eat it. Um, but, but really, it's a matter of just doing the best you can to keep them away from the hives in the first place. Yeah. Your second line of defense is going to be a quarantine area. Like I said, it can be as big or as small as you like. If you live in an apartment, you're not going to use the entire parking lot of the apartment complex for a quarantine area. Uh, you're going to, you're probably going to only need maybe a little wash basin or a bucket that you fill with some soapy water. And then you can put, if you have a, got an orchid, you want to bring it inside, put it on like a pedestal so it has like a little soapy water moat around it. So anything that's in that plant is, if it escapes, it's going to hit that water and drown. It's not going to get out. When it's in that quarantine, little quarantine area, you can check it for anything suspicious. If you find anything, you can treat it and let it sit there. So you're not going to be moving an infested plant into your house and then all of a sudden have ants all over your counter and infesting your house. Um, you can have it as big as, as you need. It could be 50 by 50 if you have a farm. It could be an entire parking lot if you have a business. Um, a nursery, if you have a nursery. It's really, really important to have a quarantine area for your nursery. You do not want to bring in stock from even from another island and then just throwing it, excuse me, throwing it and mixing it in with the rest of your, what you know is clean stock. You want to put it somewhere to look at it and make sure there's nothing uh, that's going to compromise the integrity of your product. That same concept applies to us as individuals in our own home. We don't want to compromise the integrity of our home, of our property. So having a quarantine area is very beneficial and useful. You're going to want to survey on a regular basis. Normal, uh, normal people, I mean, if you have, don't think that you have little fire ants or you don't have an ant, pest ant problem, survey once a year. What this does is it'll help you to detect them early on. And if you detect it early on, you'll be able to treat it before it gets out of control. And you'll never be over your head. So um, doing your, so we're not talking about putting out 10 sticks on an acre. We're talking about doing like a plan, a systematic survey. So what we do is we try, we suggest doing a grid throughout your property, maybe every 10 meters. So that's 10 steps. 
um, that's a pretty good idea uh, of what you have. If you have a huge, oops, sorry, if you have a huge, like a larger parcel, um, more acreage, you might not be able to do all of that at once. And that might be too much. So you start, you do what you can, do around the immediate, uh, you're using the area that you're actually using the most. Start there. When you get used to doing it and you realize it's not um, that much work, you can start expanding out from there. So keep it manageable, keep it simple as possible. How do you conduct the survey? Oh, good question. So for, uh, you want to have a lure that's right for the species you're looking for. So for example, little fire ants love peanut butter. They like oily things, and so peanut butter is kind of ideal. You put a tiny bit of peanut butter, like a translucent smear, on say a stick, popsicle stick or something, and then you just set it out in kind of shady areas as much as possible, um, and then leave it out for an hour and then go collect them after that. Uh, if you get something suspicious, make sure you remember where it's at. So write a label on the bag, um, have some kind of notes to tell you where the samples came from when you bring them into our office or somewhere to have them identified. If we confirm that, then you can go back to those areas and treat. Um, other species might not like peanut butter. They might like jelly or tuna or something like that. So if you don't think it's little fire ants, if you're concerned about something else, just Get, collect a sample, just a couple of ants that you see, bring them into our office, and we can help you identify them and give you a better idea of what to use, okay? If you don't do a survey and you just kind of go, um, you might not be actually, and you just treat, you might not actually treat the entire infestation. So something that's really common that we hear all the time is, People come in and they say, you know, I've been treating, but it doesn't seem to be working. It seems to be um, just popping up and running away from the treat treatment area. They don't like being in the treatment area. I ask them if they survey, they're like, yeah, I survey. How, how'd you survey? And they just put out, you know, a few, a few sticks or a few samples within um, a large area. So maybe 10 samples in an acre. So they did not, they were not able to detect the full extent of the infestation. They're only treating part of it. Where they're treating, it's working. But then where they're not treating, it's growing. And so it gives this illusion that the ants are running away from the treatment area. That's very common. Another thing that's common is people doing the sting test. I'm sure there's some of you guys in here that do the sting <laughs> test too. Now you go and you know, you, you know, you so know that the ants are just in this spot because that's the only place you were stung. You don't get stung anywhere else, so there can't possibly be ants over there, right? Or you pick up a little ant that you think might be a little fire ants and you put it on your arm and you watch it crawl around and it's not stinging. you. Yeah, it's not a little fire ants. It's not stinging. These are very subjective things that people do that convince them that they don't have a problem or that convince them it's not as bad as it really is. Most of the time when I convince them to go and do a real survey, they come back and like, you were right, it's everywhere. <laughs> <They're> shuffling their... <laughs> um, but the good thing about that is now they know where it is. They know really where it is. So they can actually treat the entire thing and they can actually make progress. You're never going to make progress if you only treat part of the problem. You're just going to be in this constant cycle of never getting ahead. And that's what we don't want. So when you are ready to start treating, there are different tools for different purposes. Um, you have these general insecticides, uh, like the contact sprays and uh, residual barrier treatments. Um, and then you have base that are more target specific. So the baits are gonna only affect the insects that eat it. And not all insects are gonna eat it. Um, actually very few will because these use more of like a food uh, lure 
and then you toss in some active ingredient, uh, uh, a pesticide to make it work. And so not even all ants are gonna like it because they're all gonna want a different food. Some like cupcakes, some like steak. You just don't know. <laughs> contact insecticides, these, these kill on contact, um, they're, they're not useful for wide scale treatment. Uh, but they are good for very limited, um, uh, selected, like small scale applications. So we're talking about maybe treating potted plants in, in your quarantine area as a, as a tool for your quarantine. Um, if you have uh, a, ve a vegetable garden, a small vegetable garden that you might not be able to use other products. Otherwise, you might resort to something like this to, to help. And it's, it's an added tool for your toolbox. You do have a huge variety of products to choose from, from organic to not organic, um, and for any possible use, indoors, outdoors, um, food, ornamental, lots of different products to choose from. But what happens when you, you use these things? Well, we'll just say we're using Rave for whatever. You got, you got a whole bunch of ants here that you see wandering around spray them down. Oh, you don't really see any ants. <laughs> you think, yes, I got them all! I'm a rock star! And then a couple weeks later, maybe less, maybe a week later, they're all back. And you start wondering what's going on. And then you think about, oh yeah, those foragers are only 10% of the colony. All you did was kill off some of those workers. And then the other ants are out there, they go on scene. The, the eggs keep hatching, um, so they become more workers. They send more of them out foraging. Um, the queens just pump up egg production to keep it going and to compensate. So really, you did nothing. You patted yourself on the back for no reason. Um, <coughs> the residual insecticides, um, these are like the barrier treatments. So these are really effective if you want to treat around your house, if you want to keep the ants out of your house, um, or if you want to keep the ants within a containment area like your, your, uh, your quarantine area. You don't want them to get out, so you can contain them in there, or you don't want them in your house so you can keep them out. Um, they're, not the, they're not ideal for treating around your property because there's so many ways that the ants could avoid that barrier. You're going to need a physical barrier to go with it, whether it's a driveway, whether it's low cut grass, um, gravel. Um, you can't have trees or vegetation overhanging it because that becomes more of like a bridge that they can just crawl over and drop on the other side. Um, so that's, that's not the best use for these kind of products. But you do have, um, different formulations. You can get a concentrate liquid that you can mix up yourself uh, and then go spray where you want. Around the perimeter of your house is a perfect example. Uh, you have these ready to use products like the Ortho Home Defense. It comes with a handy little spray nozzle that you just shoot and go. Or you can get these granules that you sprinkle around and then you water in. The problem with these, and I get this on a regular basis, is that people confuse these granule barriers with granule baits. Because a lot of these brands, like Spectracide, Amdro, a lot of these brands have a lot of products. They have herbicides, they have insecticides, they have barriers, they have baits, they have it all. And so you're gonna need to really know what makes them different, how to tell the difference. Uh, the barrier treatments are gonna say sprinkle around and water in because it has to dis uh, distribute and then dry for it to bind to a surface. The base are gonna say do not get wet because once it's wet, it's not gonna be attractive and active ingredients will start to degrade very, very quickly. Okay, so that's a good, easy way to remember what you're buying, okay? Another thing, always be in full control of your product. Some people will spread it around and wait for the rain to wash it in, to wet it, 
and distribute it. You don't have control of the rain. You don't know when it's going to stop. It, it can spread off-site. It can dilute it too much um, so that it might not be as effective. Uh, it can leach. It can follow the rain. If it rains for days on end, it can leach down into the soil, which it's not normally supposed to do. Once it dries, it binds to the soil. So it, make sure you have it, you apply on the day that it'll actually dry and bind, and then you're, you're solid. Baits are my favorite because they're easy to use. You don't really got to think about it too much. Um, you, all you need to think about is treating the full area, okay, and not leaving any, anything kind of unturned. But you don't have to have full coverage. You don't have to saturate anything. All you're doing, you're doing a broadcast and it's little tiny specks everywhere. It's so diffuse that you're really not gonna see where you treat it. it you're not gonna notice it at all. And the ants are gonna actually come out, seek it out, uh, and then bring it back. So you're using their foraging abilities, their natural behaviors against them. This whole like foraging, oops, um, this whole um, foraging behavior, going out, getting resources, and bringing it back to feed the entire colony is one of the things that really makes ants successful in life. But you're taking that strength and you're using it against them. And it's a really good weapon to have because there's a lot of ants out there and they can bring a lot of bait back and kill a lot of queens. Um, there's a variety of baits you can choose from, from ready to go to mix your own. Um, the granules are great for uh, the ground, but they're not going to treat in the tree. So if your species is up in the trees, uh, it's, it's really only going to treat part of the problem or not at all. So you want to make sure that you know what product is going to be suitable for your species. This is common for little fire ants. People get those fire ant baits, just spread them around the yard. Don't realize that the ants in the trees are not coming down to feed on that bait. So we talk to them about mixing up the gel that we have a recipe for, and then they have great success because now they're treating the entire system. Uh, all of the ants are gonna vary in what they prefer. Remember, some like, some like cupcakes, some like steak. Um, some just like to suck down a big old glass of oil. Um, and so knowing what species you have is going to help you decide which of those baits you're going to use. Um, little fire ants and other fire ant kind of species, they really like the oil baits. And so if you get Amdro, um, it's just going to be a little corn grit that's soaked in soy oil with a little tiny bit of toxicant in there. If you have yellow crazy ants or maybe Argentine ants, they're gonna like maybe more sweet things, maybe sugary or like a, a sugar protein. So with yellow crazy ants, they mix up uh, like a cat food and corn syrup mixture. Um, and so it really is gonna depend on what you have to what you, uh, and that's gonna determine what product you wanna get or what you wanna make up. Other than that, it's basically, you have your bait, whatever you decide on, and you spread it all out. And you just Johnny Appleseed that stuff all over the place. There are different um, active ingredients that you can choose from. There's, there's toxicants that actually kill the, the ants. Um, and then there are growth regulators that don't kill anything. They affect the reproduction. So you're going to get, diff obviously, you can expect different results. The toxicants are going to see an instant um, decline, probably about 24 hours. The growth regulators, you're going to see a very slow, gradual decline over time. There's the growth regulators. Um, the growth regulators affect the reproduction, so the queens aren't laying the eggs so much, and whatever eggs are there, they're not going to really turn into adults. If they do, they're all deformed and they can't reproduce. This, the growth regulators are fantastic if you have a really heavy infestation. If you have a, a very mild infestation, it, it's not as good. I would probably just go with a toxicant off the bat. 
some of the examples of um, baits that you might find. Um, this is basically what the granules look like. Little little corn corn grit. Kind of looks a little it's similar to like rolled oats or something. Um, and then this is the Hawaii Ant Lab gel mixture. It's really thick. It's like pudding. Um, and yes, we can squirt that around through our application devices. Um, you have a couple of options to, for active ingredients in here. You have a toxicant and you have a growth regulator. Um, as far as granules are concerned, you really only have uh, toxic-based um, products to choose from. Um, there isn't, uh, for at least for little fire ants, there isn't a granule that is attractive and effective um, with a, a growth regulator in there. Pretty much the things that we use, it's pretty simple. Most people use a little seed spreader for their granules. Um, for the gel, if you have just a small house lot, one of those Zep squirt bottles does wonders. That one Zep bottle can treat up to 10,000 square feet. If you don't have a whole lot of vegetation, of course. Um, for larger jobs, we use those backpack sprayers, the jack toes, because we can shoot 30 feet with one of these up into the trees. Um, the squirt bottles, we can get about 15 to 20 feet. So not bad for a little squirt bottle shooting, shooting pudding. This is something that a lot of people really don't, or they, I mean, a lot of people like to argue with me over. I get people arguing with me over base stations all the time. They're like, base stations are great. I see the guys at the Google market. They have all these great base stations and I want to use them. Um, really, they're, they're only good for a very limited, uh, limited situations. Um, the amount of base stations you would need to cover and to treat uh, a full house lot is astounding. It's, it's, it's going to be far more time labor intensive that it's, it's not worth it. So broadcast around the yard for the entire area if you can. Base stations if you, if you have to put, to put in the house. You know, you want to keep them contained and away from kids and pets in the house. Um, uh, as you can see with the broadcast, you're, you're using a very little bit. You don't have to identify where the nests are because you're diffusely broadcasting. You're having little tiny specks everywhere. And so they're going to come out and seek it. And if you have a lot of specks everywhere, it's going to raise the chances of them finding it quickly and effectively and then recruiting in a timely manner. Site control, basically what, uh, what I've been saying, you don't want to, you need to treat the whole system, remember? Uh, you can't just put a band around your house and call it good, say, I don't know why, I don't know why the ants are still there, I, I, I treated, yeah, I broadcast it around my house. How, how far from your house? Oh, two feet. It's not going to treat everything to your property boundary unless your property boundary is, you know, five feet from your house. Um, so make sure that you get the entire system in order to kill the source of the problem. Okay, you don't want to just uh, treat the symptoms. So basically, this is the end. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> um, don't just don't forget don't forget prevention first line of defense the easiest thing to do detect through your monitoring through your surveys to make sure you can detect them early on and not get into a bad situation um, treat if and when you need to and treat the entirety of the the situation and then maintain that so one treatment isn't going to take care of it. You're going to have to treat more than once. Um, we generally tell people once every six weeks for little fire ants, and you do that several times um, in order for long-term results, because the goal is for you guys to get long-term results and get to an end so that you can go to prevention. That's, that's the whole point of treatment. So with that,
been more and more detections on Maui and I work very closely with the Maui Invasive Species Committee for um, eradications um, and try to educate educate the public to try to get more people to turn in samples. But so um, he can, um, is like more, I noticed in your um, picture, it seems like on the side they don't have as many as we saw. Uh, it's, oh, it's growing. It's definitely growing. There's, um, we haven't gotten a whole lot of reports, but every year we're getting more and more and more. So it doesn't uh, matter where the um, climate is? Not particularly. And in fact, uh, there, there was a nursery in Kihei that was detected, uh, or the ants were detected, or little fire ants were detected over there. Um, it was a Kihei nursery. Um, maybe not exactly Kihei nursery. <laughs> yeah, it was a Kihei nursery. And they had, um, they had imported some product from the Big Island, um, probably from an infested nursery. So they didn't do their quarantine. They didn't check the plants um, before they started mixing them in with the rest of their stuff. Um, when they, uh, when HDOA and MIS went to investigate and to check on it uh, or do their surveys, uh, it was, it looked like that it had been there for a while. Knowing that, the nursery has had infested material for a while. There are probably a lot more sites on Maui that have little fire ants than we know about. Yeah, and that's how the whole thing starts. Yes, in the back. Um, my friend moved here five years ago to the HPP, so Puna area. Mm -hmm. uh, and then brought me over about a year later because he wasn't physically able to do the level of work to have an acre of jungle, really. Mm -hmm. um, so needless to say, right away, I thought oh, I had to do something. Like, I visited the fire ants seminar for this Saturday. I've seen great success by using um, the tangleweed mm -hmm. mixed according to their specifications. And, um, and every now and then, you know, I've had back but just recently um recently i ran into two things that frustrated the heck out of me um one of them i knew i wasn't getting them at the top of a huge coconut tree right um, even if i was getting drops of the stem of it somewhere um it obviously wasn't enough and just you know like a few weeks back a, a good wind blew some into my body and i ended up you know scratching and going oh no uh, and this is what the regular, and I still regularly treat. You have to there. It's just, in fact, I treat over into the vacant areas right. nearby and with permission into even the neighbor's property. Um, so this is a well treated area. And then the second thing that happened was we had some of our hollow, that beautiful variegated hollow, and it's a huge piece of it. I mean, it's stretches along the front of our property, so there's a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And a huge hump of it broke our fence, and you know, so I chopped it and just took it to the greenway. <laughs> Sorry, don't throw anything at me. Or... It's okay, everybody take this stuff to the greenway. <laughs> <laughs> but when I went back in to do more cleaning, because I realized that, you know, I had to, I had to clean it out inside, because mm -hmm. it was full of mines. And that's when I found fire ants living quite happily, lots and lots of them deep in the center of this. So even though I've been treating the whole thing quite actually extra because of the nature of the hollow is just extra friendly to the fire ants, right. um, I've, I've still got them. So now I'm cleaning the inside out, hopefully without getting bit too much. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to do my next treatment 
inside of there along with the rest of the property. But I'm just getting, that really frustrated me and, and it got me really angry enough to come here and go, gosh darn it, it you know, I want yeah. to keep the tops and the trees. And so, and money. that brings up something that I did not discuss here. Um, but we normally talk about in our ant management clinics, which, I mean, we do once a month. We actually had one today. So this is my second time today. Uh, but sanitation. Sanitation is, sanitation is um, a big part of kind of taking an integrated approach to managing the ants. Because when you do sanitation, you're reducing habitat. So sanitation isn't only like, cleaning up the junk and the garbage in the yard. Uh, it's also phytosanitation, so pruning, pruning your trees, um, getting rid of uh, vines and stuff that are clogging up the trees, because all of this is additional habitat. Cutting, keeping your lawn manicured, um, taking off the dead, all the dead fronds from hapu'u or uh, banana, you know. Uh, so reducing that habitat so that you can effectively uh, distribute baits and whatnot through that area um, and force them to actually uh, only move in certain air in certain places so that they don't avoid the bait accidentally uh, yeah but that's a, a very good um, point also the tall trees you just you got to get up as tall as you can as high as you can and that's just how it is like the albiza you can have an albizia down the block and a strong wind comes and it's going to blow um, ants out of there. So the risk is never going to go away. And that's why surveying and monitoring once a year will help you identify once you get something introduced, if it establishes, you can detect it early on before it spreads through your whole property. It's not like you're going to have an ant, uh, a nest blow onto your property and then that year your whole place is infested. It'll take time for it to actually grow um, and spread out on its own, unless you're moving it around. And so um, the surveying and is key. One, two. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, an infrared chemical. Or, or chemical. Um, they do, and uh, some ants do uh, give off um, like an infrared. Uh, uh, like a heat signature, um, for example, red fire ants or imported fire ants, uh, they get out, give off a heat signature, but the, the colony has to be big enough. So they've tried to do that in other places of the world for detection, like uh, Australia. They're trying to do, um, go through and do um, infrared scanning of, site, of an area in order to see what the extent of the, the infestation was, because those ants can fly five kilometers to establish from the original nest. Now, that, those are the ones we don't want here, and we're working really hard to prevent them. So some ants can. Um, the little fire ants, I don't believe they can. Um, chemical signatures, they all have pheromones. And so if we could um, identify certain pheromones, then we could do different things with them. USDA is working on uh, different pheromone lures. I think they've identified an alarm pheromone with, that would make them aggregate and come out, um, but not something that would stimulate feeding. So if they ever refine it to the point that it can be used um, effectively and cost effectively, then it would be great for quarantine procedures for the state to be able to go through produce and products, uh, nursery exports and whatnot to to see if there's fire ants in the, those commodities, in those boxes, before being shipped off site. Have pesticides on Um, I don't know. You would have to go to the, um, I think there's, uh, there's at least one thing that's been published um, from USDA PBAR here. Yeah. Yes. Um, when I can get my fire ants, it's incredibly me, it feels like a hot needle for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then I get big, ugly, nasty red welts for about two weeks. Weeks? Yeah, mine lasts for a couple of weeks. 
if Sorry. it's not in an area that's being constantly irritated, it's not really that itchy, it's just ugly. Um, but when it's like on your waistline, which it usually is, or when it's on your neckline, which it usually is, um, then it's constantly being irritated by your clothes and it gets really itchy. I know I've had some friends that have been, um, they've lived in situations where it's constantly coming in and they're constantly being stung in their beds like, like 50 times and they've had to go to the hospital. Um, not like anaphylactic shock, but definitely delirium, um, dizziness, um, shortness of breath. I don't know if this is true or not, but it's still on the internet, like 5% of people shy from fire ants. Um, those are different fire ants, it's not the same species, yeah. And so when we do the Google search for fire ants, 90% of what you're going to get is the red imported fire ant. Um, and actually, how many of you guys saw the Big Island, or yeah, Big Island Now? Um, advertisement for this? No? They had a picture of red imported fire ant on there instead of the little fire ant. So it's a very common thing. People just say, oh, fire ant, they pull something off of Google, the first thing they see and post it up there. So knowing the difference between the species is important. Um, I seem to have like ants coming out of my electrical socket. Any particular reason why they do that? Um, they, I don't know. They really like, I don't understand it, but some species love electrical fields. Um, if it's little fire ants, then it means you have a really bad infestation outside and there's no more nesting habitat. So they're coming inside and actually nesting inside. And they will nest in, they will nest in electrical sockets and they will nest in drains. Yeah, you can run water through that and they'll still be there and still come out of the drains. Yeah, but there are other species like the Singapore ant, which has been a big problem here in the past that they love electrical units and wires. So the Kona airport had an infestation of them in the parking lot for many years. People would park there, come back from vacation, and wouldn't be able to start their car because their uh, electrical system was like destroyed. So they're eating the wires in there? Um, the Singapore ant did, yeah. I don't know why, just crazy little buggers, I guess. Um, can, can you provide uh, some suggestions for little fire ants? For little fire ants? Um, uh, all of the ones that I mentioned up here are, are very successful. So Andro works excellent. Um, Max Forest Complete and uh, Extinguish Pro, those, those all work very, very well. Um, the gel bait that we have a recipe for works excellent. Um, and so it, it's just gonna be, do it every four to six weeks, several times, um, and choose the right bait for your house. So if you just have lawn with some very short vegetation, not a whole lot of um, vegetation or landscaping, then the ready to use granules work very well. Uh, if you have a lot of trees, forest, or like orchard, stuff like that, then just mix up the gel and splatter that stuff everywhere. Um, if you, it toxic no, no, it's not. Yeah. Um, and you guys can go on to our website, thelittlefireants.com, and uh, it has, there's uh, resource links, um, and there's, you can download all of our how-to guides and the recipes and all of that stuff for free. So all of our research is on that website. Littlefireants.com. So um, some of the conflicting information I got had to do with the dry baits. That um, on one hand, I was told by someone connected with the fire ant processor maybe four years ago that because it wasn't liquid, that unless you put it into that form, it wouldn't work. And I uh, you know, I know there's the, the spreadable granular, mm -hmm. so how, how does that work with a, a, an ant that brings it in via liquid? Um, they, so the fire ants are not, they don't build the nest that other ants do, so they're not necessarily going to be taking the granules back to the nest very much. If you put a pile out, you're still going to have a pile there, you know, a week later. Um, but the ants will suck out the oil 
and the toxicant with it from from the granules. So yeah. So don't worry about that. Uh, people are like, the granules are bigger than the ants. How are they going to carry it away? <laughs> don't worry, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, if you're going to use, one plant. yeah, uh, for just like a one plant thing, yeah, that's a perfect example of using like a contact spray. Um, when you use that, like, say you're using seven, you want to follow the, make sure you're following the directions properly. And they're always going to say, you know, spray until dripping wet. You know, it's not like a light misting over it. You need to really have good coverage. Um, that said, some plants are going to be easier to cover than others, right? So like pineapple or tea leaf or banana, they have all those little pockets in there that you have to make sure to get that insecticide in because that's where they like to build their little homes. Yeah. Yeah. I have two questions actually. Um, what is the little fire so okay on the second question first um you only need uh, a fertile queen to start a new colony is that the niche is this going to be doing older things older um, the foragers are all sterile females. So if you if you pick up if you leave your bag on the ground and you get a few of those ants as workers on your bag and you take them home, they're gonna wander around um, aimlessly until they eventually die. Um, but if you take even a single queen and you move it, uh, she's been if she's made it, she can start the whole thing all over again. Um, not so much, but I mean, they don't hang on so well, and so I mean, they can they can blow on, onto your car, or it's more like if um, if you have something sitting around, like a pot of plants sitting in your yard or a friend's yard, they're going to move into that pretty quick. Um, if they're looking for a new home, if you have your car, you're parked on your property that has a lot of fire ants, they're probably going to move into your car, and then you can transport them that way. Um, as far as being established here, yes, they're established. Um, and they've been here since 99. That's when, at least that's when we first, I, we got our first um, sample. So they were here several years before that because it was already in the nursery system and kind of out of control by the time somebody reported it. One more question up there and then we'll, uh, Stop with the formal questions, but it'll take us a few minutes to clear up. So I think, gentlemen, what's the best broadcast bait that doesn't get affected by the rain? So I heard that Andrew can't get wet. Right. So, what um, you so you can just spread around the property and not worry about getting wet. So uh, the the gel is excellent because uh, I mean the rain it will wash it away, but if it's like a light mist or if the ground's wet, it's not going to make it ineffective. The only other thing would be siesta or or ultra bin, but big, 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 but <laughs> it doesn't come in a small quantity. <clears throat> it's only a giant like 15 pound bag and that's really expensive. You got to use that stuff up within like three months because it goes rancid real quick. So yeah, so if you don't want, if, if, it, if you set it out, out, the granules out and you have four to six hours of dry weather, that's all you need. So even with Andrew, it doesn't have to be out for days on end. Um, so the bait station is kind of like it's it's a lot more work than it's worth because it doesn't have to be out for a ton of time. The ants are going to find it real quick, and it's going to be very effective. Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. Please stick around and. Uh,